medcram.com. Welcome to another MedCram video. We're going to talk today about myocarditis, pericarditis, and myocardial infarction, otherwise known as a heart attack. We're also going to talk about how to distinguish between them using echocardiography and also EKG and whether or not a smartwatch can be used to differentiate between those three diseases. Smartwatches have been around for a long time, but some of the newer ones have a feature on it called ECG, or electrocardiogram. This feature allows your watch to monitor the electrical pulses that are given off from your heart. So an ECG is something that you might get in a doctor's office or an emergency room, and it's a way that a clinician can look in many different ways at your heart and how it's beating based on the electrical conduction that's going down its conduction fibers. So what is an ECG? It's basically a photograph of how electricity is moving through the heart from many different angles all at the same time. And this can be tremendously helpful in diagnosing very common heart ailments. This is what's known as a 12-lead EKG. And as you can see here, there's one, two, three, times one, two, three, four different leads. These are looking at the heart from different angles. Lead two is reproduced at the bottom all across the bottom of the page because sometimes we like to see a full 10 seconds of a particular rhythm. And since lead two looks at the right atrium, which is where the rhythm is generated, that's why we usually have lead two going across the bottom. The type of lead that you see in a watch is limited to just one of these leads. In fact, it's this one right here called lead one. We'll talk a little bit more about that. So what you're seeing here looks kind of complicated, but it's actually quite simple. And as you can see here in the upper left-hand corner, we have that red arrow that's going from the right arm to the left arm. It's got a specific viewpoint of the electrical conduction in the heart, as you can see here by Roman numeral one, and what that looks like on the ECG. And if we look at it from different aspects here on the second one, we can see it going from the right arm down to the left foot, and that's lead number two, as you can see there. And it looks slightly different because we're looking at it at a slightly different angle. An additional lead here on the right is lead three, and you can see it's going from the left arm down to the left foot. And that again has a slightly different unique look there as well. And as we keep going here along the bottom, AVF, AVL, AVR, those are again different looks at the electrical conduction there as well. So AVF is looking from the heart straight down to the left foot. AVL is looking at the center of the body out to the left arm. And AVR is looking at the center of the body out to the right arm. And of course, these are the views that you get on a 12-lead ECG. Because you're putting your two hands together on a watch, however, you're pretty much going to be limited to what you see here in lead Roman numeral 1 in the upper left-hand corner. And as you can see here, when somebody is wearing the watch, in this case on the left hand, the back of the watch is picking up the electrical signals from the left hand. And what the watch is constructed and engineered to do is when the person touches their right hand to the crown of the watch, as it's called, then the watch is able to get the electrical signal from the right hand. And as you can see there, it's generating an ECG rhythm in lead one. And again, that's where we compare the electrical conduction from the right arm going over to the left arm. And that's picked up here in the watch because the watch is touching the left arm. And as soon as you touch the crown of that watch there where the knobs are with the right finger, that connects the electrical circuit and the watch is able to generate a single lead ECG, in this case, lead one. Because a watch will only give you one lead, it's going to be difficult to distinguish, as we'll see, between myocarditis and pericarditis and myocardial infarction. Let's take a look here and see how the anatomy of the heart helps us understand about why pericarditis looks different on electrocardiogram from a myocardial infarction. This fist is going into like a balloon. And the inside is known as the visceral pericardium. And this outside part here is known as the parietal pericardium. And as the heart beats, these two things are going to rub up against each other. They're very vascular, and so they can bleed. And you can see here, the visceral pericardium is here on the inside, and the pericardial cavity is in the middle, and the parietal pericardium is here on the outside. 
So this is a potential space that can fill with fluid. It could also fill up with blood because there is a lot of blood vessels in this area. And so the important point to understand here is that if there is pericardial inflammation, that pericardial inflammation, generally speaking, is going to be seen all throughout every side of the heart. So you should be seeing it at just about every angle. And that's important to understand because when we look at the EKG, as we've talked about before, these leads are simply looking at the electrical conduction at different angles. And we explained what those different angles are. And we explained that there are 12 of them. These ones over here are actually extended leads that you don't normally see, but here are the basic 12. And as we said, we've got lead two going along the bottom there. This here is the QRS complex, the spike. So if you reference the spike there, that's a QRS complex. This part right before it is known as the PR interval. And the part that comes after it is known as the ST segment. And what do you notice in this situation? In all of the leads, just about, you're seeing an ST segment elevation. In other words, this plateau is up above the PR interval. This is up above the PR interval. This is up above the PR interval. Over here in AVF, we can see that it's up compared to the PR interval. Even here, it seems to be a little bit elevated. But also, even over here in these leads, in V5, it's up here compared to the PR interval. It's up here in V6. Just about wherever we look here, even in V3, we're seeing it as well. So because there is a global ST segment elevation, this is usually very indicative of pericardial inflammation or pericarditis. And it would be very important to distinguish this entity from a myocardial infarction where only that inflammation is in one portion of the heart because it's only one portion of the heart that's being inflamed because only one or two vessels would be occluded at that point. Why is that important? Because one of the potential treatments for ST segment elevation in a myocardial infarction, that's where you have a blood clot that's blocking a blood vessel that's going to the muscle, the clot buster or the TPA or medication of that nature is actually going to prevent clots from forming and also bust up the clots that are actually there. Now, why would that be important? Because if this is highly vascular and there are blood clots in this area and you were to give a clot buster instead of watching the patient as you should in pericarditis or even draining it or putting them on medications, you could actually cause more bleeding if you gave them a clot buster and this area would rapidly fill with blood and would squeeze the heart so that the heart would not be able to pump effectively, and that could actually kill the patient. It's important to understand those subtleties here with the EKG. Now, here is an ultrasound that is being done on the heart. And as you can see, the heart is floating around in all of this fluid all around here. This is a sure sign on echocardiogram that the patient is having a pericardial fluid around the heart, and this may actually look like pericardial tamponade at this point. So now I want to shift gears and talk about a myocardial infarction. So as you can see here, there are blood vessels which are coming down and feeding specific areas of the myocardium of the heart. We would expect that if a blood vessel was blocked here from allowing blood to flow and give nutrients and oxygen, we would expect to see only a dysfunction or an inflammation in that portion of the heart that is being fed by that blood vessel. This is the progression that we would see on a normal EKG. This is the P wave here. This is the Q, R, S complex, and the T wave. As we go along with injury, if we block the artery to that area, you will see an increase in the T wave first, and then you will see an increase in the ST segment. This is what we were talking about before with the pericardial effusion, except here, you're only going to see it in a specific area of the heart that is being damaged. As that ST segment starts to come back down in resolution, as you can see here, there is also a deepening of these Q waves. So that when you see Q waves, that means that you've had an injury and a completion of that myocardial infarction. And then finally, the ST elevation improves back down to normal after the acute injury and then finally normalizes. This is how it looks normally. Notice there's no Q wave. An acute injury pattern would show this ST segment elevation only in the leads where the heart attack is happening. After that ST segment revolves after the acute portion, what you're left with permanently is this Q wave. So you can actually tell if there's been a permanent myocardial infarction. So let's take a look at that. Here again, we see ST segment elevation in lead two, in lead three, and in lead AVF. 
Those are the inferior leads, so this patient is having an inferior myocardial infarction. However, you may notice here that there is some significant ST segment reciprocal depression. There's also depression in V2 and depression in lead 1, and so it is certainly not global ST segment elevation. So in this case, because we're seeing it predominantly in lead 2, 3, and AVF, we are going to conclude that this is an inferior myocardial infarction, and if the patient cannot make it to the cath lab soon enough, then we may need to give this patient a blood thinner. So because it's important to be able to distinguish different leads between pericarditis myocarditis and a myocardial infarction, a watch is probably not going to be sufficient to be able to tell you that distinction. Understanding and learning about ECGs or EKGs is really key, and I would be remiss if I didn't tell you at medcram.com, we have 10 continuing medical education credits for a 10-hour plus course that has already gotten over a thousand reviews, nearly five stars, and it will make you an expert in interpretation and learning all of the aspects of ECG. This is one of our most popular courses, and it'll also give you your requirements for continuing medical education. And on our MedCram website, we have our in-house instructor, Dr. Joshua Jaquette, who is an emergency room physician and a world expert on ultrasonography, who actually learned from and was mentored by Dr. Daniel Lichtenstein, who is the world expert on lung ultrasonography. And as you can see, we have a number of reviews here, all of them in the five-star area. Something else that's really cool is that MedCram was able to partner with the Alliance for International Medicine. They are providing ultrasound courses in Cambodia to Cambodian physicians, and they're having live faculty teach them ultrasound, and they're using our lectures by Dr. Joshua Jaquette as the basis for their instruction. You can see here in our MedCram blog that MedCram has partnered with the Alliance for International Medicine to provide its ultrasound courses in training of medical personnel. We had an update from Dr. Steve Rondeau, the CEO and Chief Medical Officer for the Alliance for International Medicine, who is heading up the project. He reports that they have an unprecedented interest in the training and have been able to attract a world-class faculty to help with teaching. Here you can see Dr. Akiva Leibovitz from the Harvard Medical School teaching the students and physicians on ultrasound course in the intensive care unit. If you want to learn further information about AIM, we will post a link to their website in the description below. Thank you for joining us. Don't forget to subscribe, turn on notifications, leave us a comment, but more importantly, join us at medcram.com.